Good afternoon. Today is Thursday, September 10th, 2020. I'm Nicolette Peterberry, part of the Division of Policy and Education at OLA, and today it is my pleasure to welcome our speakers, Dr. Samuel Kartner and Axel Wolf, to the OLA online seminars to present the seminar titled Update on the AVMA Guidelines for the Euthanasia of Animals 2020 Edition. Samuel C. Kartner, DVM, PhD, is the director of the Animal Resources Program at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, UAB, in Birmingham, Alabama. He received his DVM from Auburn College of Veterinary Medicine and PhD from UAB. He is a diplomat of the American College of Laboratory Animal Medicine, ACLAM. His research interest includes the refinement and application of animal models to improve human and animal health. Dr. Kartner is the chairperson of the Laboratory Animal Working Groups on both the American Veterinary Medical Association, AVMA, Panels on Animal Euthanasia and Depopulation. Dr. Axel Wolf currently serves as De Deputy Director in the Office of Laboratory Animal Welfare, OLA. At OLA, he has also served as the Director of the Division of Compliance Oversight and as a Senior Assurance Officer. Prior to joining OLA, Dr. Wolf was the Director of the Veterinary Resources Program in NIH Intramural Biomedical Research Support Program. Dr. Wolf's interest in unique research animals has involved him in work with armadillos, chimpanzees, and fruit bats, as well as the more common species. During this presentation, Drs. Wolf and Kartner will address comments that OLA received from a request for information regarding the implementation of the 2020 AVMA guidelines. These comments and the AVMA's response can be found in their entirety, apart from personally identifiable information that was removed, on the webinar webpage under resources. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the OLA online seminar and now to hand the microphone over to Axel. Thank you, Nicolette. Let me start by stating that since its inception, the Public Health Service PHS Policy on Humane Care and Use of Laboratory Animals Policy has incorporated by reference the American Veterinary Medical Association's AVMA Guidelines on the Euthanasia of Animals. It states that methods of euthanasia used will be consistent with the recommendations of the AVMA Panel on Euthanasia unless a deviation is justified for scientific reason in writing by the investigator. The Office of Laboratory Animal Welfare, OLA, continues to support the collective assessment of subject matter experts assembled on various AVMA panels addressing various methods of humane killing, such as euthanasia and depopulation of a wide variety of animal species. Updates to the guidelines are made when a preponderance of new peer-reviewed literature points to a need for revisions to ensure that the most humane methods are being used. Panel decisions are science and evidence-based rather than relying on anecdotal or opinion pieces. The previously recommended CO2 flow rates of 10% to 30% were heavily criticized by users based on observational assessments rather than physiological findings. The current recommended flow rates of 30 to 70 percent were established based on new published evidence. Debate among professionals in all scientific fields is the norm and helps stimulate ongoing efforts for continuing improvement. Neither AVMA nor OLA supports decisions on humane killing of animals based on cost, convenience, tradition, unsupported anecdotes, or any other reasons other than a science and evidence-based assessment with the ultimate goal being maximum animal welfare. During this webinar, we will include discussion of the public comments that were submitted to OLA in response to the request for information on the implementation of the updated AVMA guidelines for the Euthanasia of Animals 2020 edition. The responses to this RFI will be posted on the AVMA landing page at a future date. 
I will also address two topics that raise questions and provide the reasoning behind the decisions made by the AVMA panel. OLA will not be changing any of our guidance in response to the comments we received or the AVMA's response to the comments. No further clarifications will be provided at this time and our expectations remain the same. Institutions should use the 2020 edition of the AVMA guidelines for the euthanasia of animals unless scientifically justified and reviewed and approved by the IACUC. OLA expects full implementation after October 1st, 2020. Manual blunt force as a method of euthanasia. When performed correctly, manually applied blunt force trauma is an acceptable method of euthanasia for suckling pigs. However, the guidelines also state that Individuals should actively seek alternatives, which may appear contradictory. <clears throat> this method is acceptable with conditions, but user fatigue may result in the conditions not being met, which could negatively impact the technique. Also, the procedure is aesthetically displeasing and potentially distressing to individuals performing it, as well as to the public. Anyone performing the technique must be trained and standard operating procedures should be in place, which include information about other methods to help mitigate operator error or safety concerns. <clears throat> Cardiac compression in birds. Another common concern was the use of thoracic compression as a method of euthanasia for wild avian and mammalian species. This procedure, also known as cardiac or cardiopulmonary compression, is usually used in field studies, but there are limited data on the degree of distress induced and time to unconsciousness or death. It is possible that pain and distress does occur before the animals become unconscious. Some birds die from aortic rupture causing exsanguination, and AVMA states that exsanguination is to be performed only on unconscious animals. Therefore, thoracic compression is considered to be unacceptable for conscious animals, but may be used in deeply anesthetized or insentient ones. Anesthetics can be administered in the field by open drop or injectable methods using non-controlled agents. Also, practical portable CO2 chambers have been demonstrated at workshops and supported by OLA for euthanasia purposes in the field for small birds and mammals. A good resource for field euthanasia methods is the March 28th 2018 OLA online seminar. A link to this resource is provided on the slide. Scientific justifications allow flexibility. Deviations from the guidelines have always been allowed with appropriate scientific justification and IACUC review and approval. Thank you, and I will now turn this over to Dr. Samuel Kartner. Thank you, Axel, for the invitation to participate in this webinar, and thanks to all the participants for their interest. I think your attendance confirms your recognition that euthanasia of animals is one of the most sensitive and important tasks that people working with animals can perform. Reviewing and updating the AVMA guidelines improves the techniques employed and ensures animals are treated respectfully and humanely, even in challenging situations. I hope that this webinar will be informative and allow continued feedback that result in improved guidelines. I would first like to start with a little bit of history about the panel. The 2020 panel was comprised of 14 members, 11 of which chaired working groups. There were three technique groups and eight species groups. There was also a trained ethicist that authored the introduction. The working groups each had four to six additional members that were considered experts in their species or field of study. The panel generated the final product of a 121 page report, which is 20 pages longer than the 2013 edition. As in 2013, the full AVMA membership was solicited with an open comment period. And the panel continues to exist as a virtual entity to respond to inquiries. Since the 2013 edition, the AVMA has developed separate guidelines for humane slaughter and depopulation. The AVMA also has hosted the second symposium on humane endings in 2018. 
This is an excellent venue for sharing critical thinking on these important and sensitive subjects and shows the AVMA's continued commitment to data-based improvements that meet societal needs. I would like to review some of the major changes in the 2013 edition that in many instances contributed to the revisions in the 2020 edition. The 2013 edition included a significantly expanded introduction that emphasized the importance of minimizing distress as well as pain. The introduction discussed the activities to reduce distress prior to euthanasia and post-euthanasia activities, such as carcass disposal. The introduction discussed how animal welfare considerations are balanced against the merits of the experimental design and merits of the research, and state that respectful and humane treatment of research animals will be largely up to ICOOKs. It also includes a compelling, thoughtful, and thorough discussion of ethical issues such as the intentional killing of healthy animals. The 2013 guidelines for the first time included diagrams for a proper placement of physical methods in livestock. It also included a glossary that was developed to define important terms in a specific manner. Previous ver versions of the guidelines used the term conditionally acceptable for those methods that required specific conditions. This recommendation was often considered a substandard, less than our ideal method. We changed the recommendation from conditionally acceptable to acceptable with conditions. The 2013 guidelines emphasize that acceptable and acceptable with conditions are an equal standard. There is no reference nor requirement for scientific justification in the 2013 guidelines. This is because there was no clear definition of scientific justification which led to its inconsistent application by ICUC committees. The 2013 edition states that manual or mechanical dis cervical dislocation may be used for poultry of appropriate size and species when performed by competent personnel who correctly apply the technique. The 2013 panel also determined that Thoracic compression is an unimproved method based on the lack of data demonstrating the cause of death and length of consciousness. This edition for the first time discussed the euthanasia of captive invertebrates, which comprises 95% of the animal kingdom species. Inhalant anesthetics and CO2 are acceptable with conditions. One of the conditions for the use of CO2 is to limit the CO2 flow rate to 10 to 30% displacement of the euthanasia chamber volume per minute. As mentioned before, our, uh, our laboratory animal working group was, was comprised of experts in the field. And most of these participated in the 2013 edition. In 2020, we added Dr. Deborah Hickman, who is one of the primary researchers of carbon dioxide use in rodents. The process for updating the 2013 edition started as an interim update. However, the AVMA board believed the proposed changes to be significant enough to require a full review process with an appropriate period for stakeholder comment. The current update was initiated at the beginning of 2018 with a meeting of the panel to identify areas where there have been research development or feedback has been provided about potential inconsistencies or difficulties in application and the timeline was set for changes to be implemented. A second meeting of the panel occurred at the culmination of the Humane Ending Symposium in November of 2018. And while there's not time in this presentation to cover all the provisions to the guidelines in detail, I will cover the more significant updates with an emphasis on the laboratory animal section. The introduction of the 2020 edition has added text to distinguish between unconscious and other states of sedation or tranquilization. Sedated or tranquilized animals can be aroused with sufficient stimulation. Thus, animals may still be consciously aware of and connected to their environment. Therefore, an effective dose of general anesthetic should be used when performing euthanasia with methods causing distress or no noxious stimulation prior to loss of consciousness. There has been considerable discussion and much new research about the use of CO2 in the euthanasia of laboratory rodents. 
The recommendation for the slow fill method with the 10 to 30 percent fill rate appeared in the 1986 guidelines, but was emphasized in the 2013 edition. As a result, much research has been undertaken. This research has supported the use of higher flow rates. The 2020 edition recommends a 30 to 70 percent volume displacement rate per minute. Here's one of the several citations in the 2020 guidelines that supported higher flow rates. In this study, the activity levels and behavioral responses, physiological and histopathological parameters were evaluated in mice exposed to 15, 30, 50, or 100% volume displacement rate. They found no difference between the groups and concluded that the higher flow rates would be acceptable for euthanizing adult mice. While there are many charts and tables of data in this publication, I wanted to show this one as it addresses one of the main concerns of the panel, which was would higher flow rates result in animals experiencing pain prior to becoming unconscious? The red horizontal arrow shows the 40% CO2 concentration in the chamber, which is, which is accepted as a concentration that causes pain. The purple, green, red, and blue lines represent the CO2 concentration in the chamber at the different flow rates. And the yellow arrows represent the mean point of full recumbency of the mice in that group. As you can see that even at the higher flow rates of 50 and 100%, the mice are unconscious before the CO2 concentration in the chamber reaches 40%. In another study published by Dr. Hickman and her group, they looked at parameters indicative of distress, such as gasping, that is considered to be a sign of air hunger distress, and determined that at the lower flow rate of 10% volume displacement rate, that gasping occurs more frequently and longer. They also reported behavioral signs of agitation at the higher flow rate of 100% volume displacement rate. This is the same graph shown by Dr. Wolf that is from the Hickman publication that demonstrates prolonged gasping of the rats euthanized with 10% volume displacement rate represented by the red line. The rats demonstrated gasping for two and a half minutes longer than the other displacement rates. In this same study, only the rats exposed to the higher volume displacement rate of 100%, represented by the blue line, demonstrates increased running behavior. This was interpreted as a panic response. Increased running was not observed in the other groups. The 2020 update includes a number of techniques that have been added for rabbits. These appear in the laboratory animal section, even though the new techniques primarily apply to the euthanasia of rabbits in a production setting. In a control setting, such as a biomedical research facility where researchers have access to restraint devices and controlled drugs, intravenous injection of barbiturates is the primary method. Blunt force trauma should only be used in emergency situations under extenuating circumstances, such as an injured rabbit too large for the operator to effectively perform cervical dislocation and an operator without any supporting resources. This is the major publication that supported the use of non-penetrating captive bolt and cervical dislocation using a novel device. The study was especially important as blunt force trauma has historically been the most frequently used on the farm method of euthanasia of rabbits. Abattoirs have discontinued the practice due to inefficiency and operator fatigue. The study evaluated the induction of insensibility and degree of brain, brain destruction by the three methods on three sizes of rabbits. This is a picture of the non-penetrating captive bolt device used. It is a modified pneumatic nail gun weighing approximately 750 grams with a mushroom-shaped nylon bolt head 
that extends two centimeters from the end of the barrel. The device attaches to a standard air compressor. While a single discharge appeared to be sufficient for inducing immediate insensibility to all rabbits, the device was discharged twice in rapid succession in the same location. The needed operating air pressure was determined to be 90 PSI for adult rabbits, 70 PSI for grower rabbits, and 55 PSI for pre weaned kits. A minimum pressure of 50 PSI is needed to discharge the device. This is the device that is used in the abattoirs in Canada. This is a picture showing proper restraint and positioning of the, de of the device. Note that the animal is gently restrained in a plastic container with a non-slip flooring in the rear of the rabbit against the wall of the container. The operator's hand resting on the shoulder blades with thumb and forefinger placed gently around the cervical area pressing down. There is a cloth on the floor to prevent slippage and the device is positioned between the ears and eyes on the frontal and parietal bones in the center of the forehead. The advantages of this device include that it doesn't penetrate skin, reducing biosecurity and aesthetic concerns. It has also been validated for euthanasia of turkey and piglets. This is the mechanical cervical dislocation device that was used for cervical dislocation. The V-shaped stainless steel device was wall mounted at approximately shoulder height. The rabbit's head slides into the V-shaped wedge and the device acts to secure the rabbit's head prior to the, op to the, prior to the operator applying a downward force to the hips and black le back legs. The device allows for alteration of the V-shaped opening according to the rabbit size by means of an adjustable neck plate. The total number of animals evaluated were 170, and after each method of euthanasia was applied, an observer assessed the rabbit for insensibility by evaluating rabbit reflexes, postures, behaviors, and palpable heart rate. Reflexes assessed including pupillary, palpebral, toe, and ear pinch withdrawal, and corneal reflex. If the animal was not immediately insensible or it returned to sensibility as determined by the return of rhythmic breathing, vocalizations, or reflex responses, the euthanasia technique was deemed a failure and the same method was immediately reapplied. A euthanasia method was judged to have been effectively applied if the rabbit demonstrated immediate and irreversible insensibility based on no vocalizations, no response to reflex testing, and lack of rhythmic breathing until cardiac arrest. You can see you can see that the um, non-penetrating captive bolt had a 100% efficacy. The mechanical cervical dislocation device had one animal that was not immediately insensible, insensible and that was because the uh, device was not adjusted appropriate for the rabbit's size and the blunt force trauma was only 78% effective. The, the uh, lead investigator, Jessica Walsh, in this study also looked at the efficacy of CO2 euthanasia. She evaluated two different flow rates, a 28% volume displacement rate per minute and a 58 volume displacement rate. The letter A represents increased respiration. The letter B represents the time when the rabbits lost riding reflex, which was about 40 seconds for the faster flow rate and 100 seconds for the slower flow rate. C is the loss of corneal reflex and D is last breath. She reported that there were no clear signs of distress with either flow rate. This is the picture of the, euthan of the euthanasia chamber using CO2. The port in the front allowed reflexes to be assessed during the loss of riding reflex. I briefly want to review some of the other changes to the guidelines that don't necessarily in the, apply to laboratory animals, but they could. 
The CO2 was, was added as a technique for use with neonatal goats. And there are details and conditions about how to use those in the guidelines. There, about, there have also been considerable refinements and additions in the area of captive bolt and gunshot use with livestock. These updates provide more images for the correct anatomical site selection for cattle and sheep. Information has been added for llama, alpaca, deer, water buffalo, bison, chicken, turkeys, ducks, and geese. Careful consideration was given using an anatomical site at the rear head of cattle. This pole shot can be effective but it should be reserved for situations when a frontal position is unacceptable or unsafe. Traditionally, puntilla is used as a slaughter method for cam camelids. This method involves inserting a knife into the back of the neck to sever the spinal cord. Research in llamas and cattle indicate that the stab is often ineffective. Therefore, it cannot be recommended as an acceptable method of euthanasia. Since the publication of the 2013 guidelines, feedback was received in relation to the killing of embryonated eggs. There were inconsistencies in recommendations between the avian and poultry sections. After extensive discussion, it was determined that destruction by cooling or freezing must occur prior, prior to 80% of incubation, which is 17 days for chickens. Feedback was also received that some eye cooks are applying the laboratory animal requirements for CO2 flow rates to poultry, and so language was added to clarify the pre-fill methods are suitable for poultry. Relatively recently, rendering plants and landfills have refused equine carcasses euthanized with pentobarbital. For this reason, adjunctive methods have been added. Anesthetizing Horses with xylazine and ketamine can be followed with lidocaine injected intrathecally or a saturated solution of potassium chloride injected IV or intracardiac or a saturated solution of magnesium sulfate injected IV are acceptable with conditions. There has also been considerable research in the area of euthanasia methods for the use with fin fish and other aquatics. Exsanguination has been added as an approved secondary step. Recent evidence indicates that MS-222 is aversive to fish, including zebrafish. However, at this time, the benefits of its use outweigh the distress or aversion it may cause. However, this recent literature supported extending the exposure time to 30 minutes. Metomidate is currently only listed for anesthesia and analgesia on the index of legally marketed unapproved new animal drugs for minor species by the FDA. Should the index status change to include euthanasia, or should the FDA approval be obtained allowing extra label use under Amduca? Metomidate should be considered an acceptable agent in certain species of finfish. I know this research is progressing with the publication and development, so we may have an additional acceptable euthanasia agent in the near future. There are also studies supporting a two-step method of euthanasia of goldfish and some other hypoxic tolerant species, including chiclets. These revisions were added to the 2020 update. It is also worth mentioning some areas where new information was considered, but no changes were made at this time. This includes techniques that will remain unacceptable, including thoracic compression and rapid freezing of reptiles. There was new literature published on thoracic compression of small birds that indicated death was due to cardiovascular rupture, followed by exsanguination, as well as evidence that the time until wet death can be prolonged. The panel concluded that this method should remain unacceptable. The unacceptability of drowning is mentioned here as there are reports that this method was being used for culling of kid goats. So the AVMA wishes to reiterate that this method is not acceptable for any animals. 
Acceptable methods include CO2, barbiturate overdose, gunshot, and captive bolt, penetrating or non-penetrating with an adjunctive method. There is also considerable research emerging for the use of ethanol. However, it was considered not sufficient yet for the technique of cranial injection for poultry to be added. However, we will assess this for the next update. There are also mixed opinions about the use of lidocaine with, I, with the IP or intracelomic injection of barbiturate based on one study with rats. The use of lidocaine has a range of potential benefits and problems, and it was deemed that there is not enough evidence yet to recommend its routine use. This is the study that was evaluated for thoracic compression that was performed by Dr. Paul Murphy, looking at two different species of small birds and evaluating cardiovascular parameters by Doppler and neurological parameters by EEG and documenting cardiovascular rupture as the cause of death following thoracic compression. The panel concluded that exsanguination on unanesthetized un un animals was unacceptable. So this is a picture of our panel meeting in 2018. Such meetings, such in-person meetings have surely been rare over the last nine months, and I hope that uh, COVID will soon pass, and at least by 2020, or 2023, the time of our next update, that we'll be able to meet in person. I thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I think we're going to review our questions now that have been pre-submitted. Thank you, Dr. Kartner. Now we have some questions submitted to Ola on this topic in advance of the webinar. Question one, the guidelines address how to conduct the most humane method of euthanasia for animals. But what about the people who perform such procedures? Compassion fatigue is an important issue. Is there any guidance available on mitigating the impact of end-of-life decisions and euthanasia on care staff? The AVMA has recognized this need and has initiated a working group under the oversight of the Steering Committee on Humane Animal Interactions. The AVMA welcomes a representative from OLAW to participate on this working group. Thank you. Question two, why were data from other mammalian species used to conclude that rodent fetuses are unconscious in utero? Rodents differ from humans and other vertebrates in some very significant ways. What data shows that results from research in other species are applicable? The guidelines refer reference Dr. Meller's work from Massey University in New Zealand. He has published many papers on mammalian development in many species. He describes that the general pattern of neurological development appears to be similar across most mammals, irrespective of when the cap capacities for sentence and conscious perception first appear in relation to the timing of birth. The panel on euthanasia agreed with Meller and based on the work in other mammalian species concluded that rodent fetuses are likely to be unconscious in utero, and that hypoxia, therefore, would not evoke a response. Thank you. Question three. On page 76, section 3.3.3 .3 of the new guidelines, correct application of manually applied blunt force trauma is categorized as an acceptable means of euthanasia for suckling pigs. If this is the case, why does the AVMA recommend actively searching for alternatives to this method? I think uh, Axel covered part of this. Um, the panel made this recommendation because they recognize that individuals performing blunt, blunt force trauma must be well trained and must not become physically fatigued such that performance of the technique is negatively impacted. Further, Manually applied blunt force trauma is aesthetically displeasing and potentially distressing to individuals asked to perform the technique. 
psych psychological impacts on individuals performing the euthanasia technique and general societal acceptance are a few of the many, many variables that must be weighed when deliberating the choice of a euthanasia method. Thank you. Question four. Some literature strongly suggests that rapid freezing would meet the definition of euthanasia for amphibians and reptiles. In section 7.3.7, .7, why does the AVMA limit rapid freezing to amphibians and reptiles under four grams and require a secondary method? The AVMA continues to support the designation of hypothermia or freezing of amphibians and reptiles as an unacceptable method in animals greater than four grams in weight. Rapid freezing should only be used for amphibians and reptiles less than four grams in weight, and the secondary method should be used to ensure death has occurred and is irreversible. This method was based on rodent models and will li likely work for ectothermic vertebrates that fall within this weight range. However, the use of hypothermia and freezing as a euthanasia age method for these species lacks the appropriate scientific literature support to document that it meets the criteria set forth in the guidelines for the euthanasia of animals 2020. Thank you. Question five. The 2020 guidelines specify a temperature range for rapid chilling of zebrafish from two to four degrees Celsius. However, a 2018 study by Wallace et al. suggests a range of zero to four degrees Celsius may be more appropriate. Has the panel considered the information in this publication when revising the guidelines? The panel on euthanasia thanks the commenter for bringing this additional publication to the panel's attention and we'll consider its con content during the next update of the guidelines. Thank you. And we have one final question, which is more appropriately, I think, addressed to Axel. So Axel, if you can answer first, and then Dr. Kartner can weigh in. Question six, some research projects require specific methods of euthanasia that are not acceptable under the AVMA guidelines, but are necessary to produce valid scientific results. How can investigators and IACUCs address this issue while maintaining compliance? As I had mentioned earlier, methods of euthanasia that do not follow the most current version of the AVMA guidelines for the euthanasia of animals may be acceptable if there is scientific justification and IACUC review and approval. I don't have anything to add to that. Uh, the IACUCs are the, uh, uh, the uh, oversight body at each institution that should take this into consideration. Thank you, Axel and Sam. This concludes our online seminar. I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Kartner and Dr. Wolf, for sharing their time and expertise today. Our next OLA online seminar will be on December 10th, 2020. Until then, thank you for listening and goodbye. <laughs>